be your host for the upcoming seven webinars. We are very excited to have guest speakers from University of, of Miami, Karolinska Institute, Stanford University, Hunter College of City University of New York, and the Michigan State University in this webinar series. We will cover topics in HIV research, liver cancer immunotherapy, extracellular viscose generation, and more. Before I hand the mic over to today's guest speaker, Dr. Sebastian Fuchs, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. First, today's webinar will be available on demand after the live session and is accessible on the website um, of GenScript. We will upload the slide deck as well. And next, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have a question for our speaker, please feel free to send it through the chat box at the bottom of your player or tweet GenScript. We'll be answering questions at the end of the session. If you don't uh, have your questions answered during the webinar, we will be sure to follow up afterwards. And the last, we'd like to encourage you to complete a quick survey after the webinar and share today's webinar with your uh, colleagues and uh, friends. I'm at Research Center of Harvard Medical School and at University of Miami from 2013 to 2017. Dr. Fuchs has made significant contributions to the development and application of gene therapy approaches for the prevention and treatment of viral infections. And recently, they published a um, paper in immunity on HIV prevention of a um, uh, and the treatment of uh, one SHIV infected monkey. So without further ado, let's get started. Dr. Sebastian Fuchs, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Thank you very much, Tracy, for this uh, kind introduction, and thank you everyone for joining this webinar. Um, I would like to um, I'd like to ask you um, today um, the process of AV mediated antibody delivery for the prevention and treatment of HIV infection. Um, so I would like to give you. Um, a little background on HIV AIDS. So basically AIDS, um, Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, is an immune debilitating disease caused by hum human immunodeficiency virus. And HIV infection is associated with a continuous and progressive destruction of CD4 T cells, the central mediator of uh, our immune system. Uh, and consequently, it's um, HIV infection is <clears throat> associated with emerging opportunistic infections that uh, ultimately lead to death. Um, the loss of uh, viremia control and AIDS conditions occur, usually occur between less than a year and um, more than 25 years, so it differs or varies quite a lot, and <clears throat> that usually happens, so the onset of AIDS usually happens around or below 500 or below, below 200 um, CD4 T cell count per older blood. And the opportunistic infections can be of fungal nature, um, of uh, viral nature, or bacterial or parasitic. Usually, um, the first uh, AIDS uh, patients, um, those had uh, diseases such as pneumocystis, pneumonia, and candidiasis, um, Kaposi sarcoma has been seen as well. And um, one has to imagine that um, since the first reported AIDS cases in 1981 and the discovery of HIV in 1983, about 40 million people have died of AIDS-related um, diseases. Um, as of 2016, 37 million people were living with HIV um, with a continuing uh, infection rate of 2 million people per year. Um, this number is declining, but <clears throat> there are some regions of the world, especially in Eastern Europe or um, Eastern Asia, Southeastern Asia, where uh, infections are actually increasing for various reasons. Um, 
so when it comes to HIV vaccines, um, so more than 35 years have elapsed since uh, first um, reported AIDS cases and the discovery of HIV, and um, no vaccine has been developed that could um, be protective and or could protect against viral acquisition in the majority of people. About um, so six phase 2B um, or phase 3 clinical trials have been conducted and completed so far, and five of the six um, trials showed no uh, protective effects against acquisition, viral acquisition, and only one of the six, the RV144 trial, um, showed a rather modest uh, efficacy of 31%, or uh, in other words, less than a 78% chance of any efficacy at all, and that only um, when analyzed by a modified intent to treat analysis. Um, and um, furthermore, there was no induction um, of uh, protective uh, cellular uh, T lymphocyte um, response, and there was no induction of broadly neutralizing antibodies. Um, none of the six uh, trials showed a reduction uh, of viral loads. So <clears throat> the mortality rate of HIV-infected individual is more than 95% in the absence of uh, antiviral drug therapy, especially for HIV-1. Um, and um, although ART um, extends the life expectancy of infected individuals to near normal levels, um, ART does not cure HIV infection. And there's also uh, the, the burden um, associated with ART of having to take it uh, daily and uh, not miss a dose at all, otherwise the virus would rebound. Also, there are um, side effects associated with ART, uh, basically possible drug toxicities. In terms of therapy, um, only one single individual has been likely cured from its HIV infection. I mean, it's, that's insane if we think about that after 35 years. Um, and this individual, um, Timothy Ray Brown, also known as the Berlin patient, um, was cured um, following um, whole body irradiation and uh, stem cell transplant. Um, which contained uh, uh, a mutation in the CCR5 gene, which make, made it uh, almost impossible or impossible for the virus to basically grow out. Um, so what is, what's the difficulty with HIV? Why, why is it so difficult to, to develop a vaccine or to treat it? Um, I would say the first and foremost problem is its diversity. Um, uh, the, the, virus, the virus mutates at a very high rate, about 1 in 10,000 nucleotides. Um, and also, it is, a, it is capable of integrating in, into the host genome early after infection, establishing a reservoir uh, which can hide in all types of compartments. Um, for example, B cell follicles, which are not accessible by uh, uh, CD8 T cells. Um, the sequence diversity um, is only also reflected by its envelope gene uh, or envelope protein, which which basically is the uh, cell surface protein that docks to to uh, to to a CD4 T cell to infect it, and uh, one of the only targets. Uh, where HIV would be vulnerable towards uh, uh, host antibodies, and um, and there is a continuous um, um, antibody virus chase continuum. Basically, the antibody binds, and um, um, the virus then mutates away and finds way to escape. Basically, this antibody response. Also, there are on, only a low number of these envelope spikes on. The, on the virion, only about 8 to 14, and the majority of the envelope spikes are instable, and um, the, 
the majority of antibody responses to envelope is to these degraded or decayed uh, monomers of GP120, GP41, but not against the, the intact conformational envelope trimer, which, which that would be needed in order to, uh, to effectively neutralize the virus. Also, um, about 50% of the envelope uh, trimer is protected by glycan shield, which also makes uh, the access of neutralizing antibodies very difficult. Other problems are, as I said, um, antigenic T cell escape and also um, the, the NEF protein downregulates MHC uh, in infected cells, which, um, which makes it more difficult for uh, the host to present it to the immune system in order to attack uh, vir virally infected cells. Um, also, there's an evasion from innate immunity by the viral VIF and VPU genes or gene products. So, um, as I said, um, neutralizing antibodies are very rare or basically um, it, it takes a while for them to develop in an uh, infected individual. Um, usually about the first antibodies that arise after infection are about at about four weeks and those uh, attack um, GP41 because that results from the decayed envelope trimer. It's very immunogenic, but uh, those antibodies are very ineffective. They're just bind binding antibodies and they don't do anything. Um, the first neutralizing antibodies that develop after infection, it's about, uh, takes about three to 12 months. Um, and those, are, those antibodies are strain specific. Um, however, the virus finds a way to mutate away from these neutralizing antibodies. Um, therefore, as I like to say, this antibody virus chase continuum um, um, basically always, always makes the host immune response incapable of controlling the virus. Um, the virus can escape only sometimes even with single amino acid substitutions, and that happens month after month, year after year. Um, however, um, some rare uh, individuals, about one in 10,000 individuals, uh, develops potent broad neutralizing antibodies, and that after continuous replication two to four years after infection. And these, these individuals are termed elite neutralizers um, because their, their serum, uh, which contains those broadly, neutralize, broadly neutralizing antibodies, um, uh, is, is capable of neutralizing global HIV strains across clades. And although these antibodies don't have a really um, positive effect in the individual where they developed um, because the virus also co-evolved with these antibodies. Um, they are useful um, if, uh, let's say, isolated from those uh, individuals, and those could be then um, transferred to people who um, have a different virus, uh, a different viral species where the virus has not co-evolved and where the virus is actually vulnerable to these potentializing antibodies. So basically, the difficulty after years of designing an effective HIV vaccine or treatment modalities, broad neutralizing antibodies uh, could be isolated and given to people directly. Uh, for example, by passive transfer. Um, um, passive transfer of uh, a number of antibodies of about uh, BRC1, 3BNC, and 10, 10, 74, um, has shown uh, protective effects um, or antiviral effects in HIV-infected individuals um, with the result of a lowering of viral load. However, um, the bioavailability is uh, limited um, simply because once you inject it, it will only last for a couple of weeks, uh, and then um, an injection has to uh, cure again in, in order to um, to suppress uh, viremia, and 
that's a problem because the patient would need to uh, revisit the clinic uh, every month or every two months or so. So adherence is a problem, especially in the developing world. Um, and uh, also there are immense costs associated with that. I mean, producing large amounts, I mean, one would need to produce gram amounts for just one person. And so basically that scale and the production costs are just like insane. So what could be an alternative? An al the alternative could be to use a um, gene therapy approach uh, where we actually uh, take advantage of these broadly neutralizing antibodies, but rather than administer them um, uh, passively, just the protein, we can actually put the genetic sequence of uh, that antibody um, into a viral vector and the, the the individual would then produce these antibodies. And um, the adeno-associated virus um, seems very uh, uh, practical. It's, it's a very, it has uh, shown safety and efficacy in dozens of clinical trials against all kinds of inherited uh, diseases. Uh, and just to give you like a, a quick summary, basically the most, uh, best characterized AV zero type AV2, uh, has a genome of about 4.7 kilobase pairs, has two genes, and uh, flanked by um, two inverted terminal repeat, uh, three prime and five prime ITR, so it's a single-stranded uh, DNA virus. Um, so if one wants to now create a recombinant AV, um, one would just uh, replace the rap and cap gene with a unique expression cassette of a broadly neutralizing antibody. Um, and one can then also, so the only wild type sequences uh, that remain are the, uh, the wild type ITRs. And then one would actually choose um, a capsid uh, that uh, can be used in, in certain individuals because usually people would have pre-existing immunity against uh, certain AV serotypes. So in order to evade uh, neutralizing antibodies of an incoming AV, one could just like uh, use designer caps capsids. Um, and so there are two uh, actually vector systems available. Uh, one could use a, a single strand AV vector uh, where both uh, heavy and light chains are expressed from one uh, reading frame. Um, or one would co-inject uh, two recombinant AV vectors, one encoding for the heavy chain and um, the other one encoding for the light chain. So the way it works, um, the AV vector is uh, produced basically by triple transfection usually um, and um, is then purified. Uh, by all types of different methods, usually a triple cesium chloride purification. And uh, and one needs to realize that this virus is infectious, but it's replication deficient. So one would inject this uh, AV at quite a high concentration, and then this virus would then uh, transduce muscle cells um, and these uh, muscle cells are long-lived. Um, they they basically don't turn over, um, and the AAV um, genome can then persist after uncoding um, after uncoding its recombinant AV genome into the nucleus. It will stay in an episomal form, and where it's actually then stabilized uh, by um, by high molecular weight concatamer formation and um, further modification with histones, so it stays outside of the of the chromosomes in episomal form, and can basically then just produce the antibody of choice uh, continuously for the lifetime of the cell. And muscle cells are very long lived, uh, basically for decades. So, in a proof of concept. Um, experiment, uh, Phil Johnson et al. published a very uh, nice and a pioneering study in Nature Medicine in 2009. He used AV to deliver antibody-like molecules, so-called immunotesins, and 
in the left panel you see that uh, this you see the serum concentration of the delivered antibodies uh, antibody like molecules 406 um, uh, and then in three animals 507 and 4 which was a CD4 IG uh, fusion protein and um, following in, in injection of recombinant AV um, uh, the majority of animals showed um, stable levels of uh, secreted um, immunotesins and um, however some of the animals um, um, showed were actually showed um, stable levels of uh, secreted immunotesins however there was the occurrence of um, uh, anti-drug antibodies and um, so basically um, the majority of animals um, basically were uh, didn't uh, how should I say they were they didn't mount an immune response and those uh, um, those animals that didn't mount an immune response against the uh, AV produced antibody were protected by a subsequent um, um, SIV challenge so those monkeys were then infected with a, a, a pathogenic strain of simian immunodeficiency virus um, and that, that you can see on the right so in the 406 group in red you, you see the viral loads and those three animals were protected uh, from SIV challenge uh, but for 507 you see that only one animal was protected but the other two were not because the, the there was a host uh, immune response against the 507 and so the uh, 507 levels crashed and there was no protection um, so that is a problem because um, uh, we we would like to actually have persistent level of AV delivered antibodies uh, so our group started to follow up on that and we thought at that time that we can actually just avoid these uh, anti-drug antibodies by converting these artificial immunotesins into authentic IgGs so as I told you before uh, there are two strategies in place a two-vector strategy uh, where we deliver um, heavy and light chain on separate recombinant AVs and we have one vector approach where we deliver it uh, from one open reading frame um, so in that study um, three animals received the one vector approach and three animals received the two vector approach um, and on the left you can see the levels of um, secreted 507 IG1 in serum and um, I would say the majority of animals had stable levels um, of four, uh, 5 to 40 microgram per mil uh, of 507 and one animal um, even had persistent high levels as high as 250 microgram per mil. Um, however, um, so basically we learned a lot from this study. We learned that uh, delivering this antibody with one vector or with two vectors gives us comparable levels of secrete antibody. Um, however, we also learned from that study on the right, as you can see, there were still uh, immune responses or anti-drug antibodies, ADAs, against uh, uh, the incoming 507 IG1. So, and we also learned that conversion of these um, antibody sequences to um, uh, these immunotesins to uh, authentic IGs didn't avoid um, ADAs. Um, we, of course, we we challenged these animals, these six animals, together with six other animals that uh, had uh, that received the recombinant AV producing 406, and there was no um, statistical significance uh, in terms of uh, acquisition. Um, however, I would like to point out that that one animal uh, that had high persistent levels of produced 507 IG1 um, resisted six challenges with the highly pathogenic strain of SIV MAC239 um, and on the right uh, which on the right we we actually we, we published that in 2015 um, and then I think several months um, several months ago we retested um, the levels to see 
uh, to see where the levels are of 507 in that animal, and they're persisting. So basically, now six years after receiving AAV, producing this antibody, there's it's still there. This and this highlights the, the the potential, the promise of this approach. One injection, and you have high persistent levels of uh, a protective antiviral antibody if it's not attacked by ADAs. And um, we did some analysis to see what's happening in the animals. Um, and uh, these these are basically uh, ELISA assays where we uh, tried to figure out what what are the ADAs uh, attacking. And we found that uh, the ADAs are attacking um, the variable regions of the antibody. Okay, so in our 406 group, they would attack um, the 406 antibody, uh, not 507. In the 507 group, they would attack uh, 507. And we could also show there was ADA reactivity against uh, the CDR3, which is usually the longest um, component of the variable region. Um, so in, in, in that study that we published in molecular therapy, we also um, we also analyzed um, the ADAs uh, um, of other antibodies that we tried to deliver, and we actually found that the magnitude of ADAs uh, directly correlates with the distance from germline. So the more uh, broadly neutralizing antibody is hypermutated, the more it's it's is divergent from germline, the more likely it will be attacked by the immune system because it has never seen such an unusual antibody. And as I said before, it takes, in these elite neutralizers, it takes about two to four years to, to generate such an antibody. And it attains such unusual structures which confer uh, potency to the antibody, but at the same time, it makes it also very immunogenic. Um, the study that we just published um, several, two, three weeks ago uh, in immunity um, shows us another potential of AAV, uh, uh, AAV delivered antibodies, and we saw that in the Miami monkey. So a group of four animals uh, were infected with a shiv, it's a, a fusion uh, virus of uh, simin, uh, this, so the backbone of a simian immunodeficiency virus with the envelope gene of HIV in order to test the neutralization capacity. Um, so we infected four animals and um, we waited about 86 weeks. So in the chronic phase of infection, in the absence for, of ART, we then gave AV, um, three AVs actually, one uh, encoding for the protein neutralizing antibody 3BNC. As you can see on the upper right, the levels of the AV inoculation, uh, we also gave 10, 10, 74, and we also gave 10, 8, which is not shown here, uh, which didn't persist. And following this um, inoculation, uh, viral loads immediately dropped. And what is remarkable is this degree of virological control following AV antibody therapy. One shot of three common AVs suppressed by that animal for three years. Um, that is just a remarkable virological suppression. Um, we also measured all types of things, uh, but what I wanted to show you here and point out, um, in that animal antibodies to GP120, which are there, uh, also decreased uh, significantly following AAV administration. And antibodies to P27, which is uh, the, uh, the capsid, a part of the capsid uh, uh, protein, also decreased after AAV administration. And on the lower left and right, uh, you see some data from Borbello et al., um, which actually compares the, um, the, the, the antibody titers to P24 and GP120, uh, compares them to, uh, to uh, um, elite controllers, to HIV-infected individuals that are not on ART, and HIV-infected individuals that are on ART. And as you can see, individuals that are, um, that are, 
undergoing uh, ART treatment or like take drugs daily, they don't have decreased levels of P24, okay? Um, however, in uninfected individuals and in the Berlin patient, the only person who was cured of his uh, HIV infection, it is reduced. And in our monkey, we also saw a reduction. So the antiviral effects are way more profound than with, with for example, just ART. Um, we tried to we tried to reproduce the success story of that one uh, monkey, and we enrolled several more monkeys into a study, um, and basically 12 more monkeys, and six of the monkeys received a cocktail of four antibodies, um, encoding for PGT-145, 35022, and N6, and PGT-128. Um, so of these 12 monkeys, so let's take, of these six monkeys, only two were capable of uh, controlling uh, viremia uh, to a certain degree. There were some viral blips, um, but w those animals were not as durably suppressed as the Miami monkey, for instance. And the reason for that, again, uh, there was an occurrence of um, anti-drug antibodies and um, that you can see basically here. So these are the two groups on the on the top left. You see the the group that received two antibodies or two AAVs encoding for these two antibodies. And on the uh, upper right, you see the group uh, that received the four antibody cocktails. And um, and I would just like to highlight um, on, on, on the left for PGT-145 and 35022. So this is kind of uh, the worst scenario that we could envision. You basically see that there was some antibody um, levels at the beginning following AV inoculation, let's say after four weeks. And then um, uh, ADAs kicked in, which you can see on the two right panels, lower right panels. And those ADAs basically prevented um, the, the delivered antibodies to be present in serum and to exert antiviral effects. Um, and that's a very big problem. And um, I would like to just then summarize. Um, I can say that AV media gene transfer can result in high-level long-term delivery of monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and as you saw in that one animal that um, basically showed uh, AV delivered antibody levels uh, at six years, we can say that AV immediate delivery of monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies has the potential to create a preventive barrier against immunodeficiency virus infection and which is long lasting. Um, however, as I pointed out several times, host immune response, especially these anti-drug antibodies, these ADAs, remain a problem, a hurdle to this approach, and uh, that needs to be understood and overcome uh, for effective use of this approach in humans. And I also, as I also highlighted in a therapy setting, the, the Miami monkey case study really highlights the potential of AAV antibody. Uh, delivery um, and towards a functional HIV cure. And we were able to show for the first time um, a, f a functional cure in an, um, a SHIV-infected macaque uh, during the chronic phase of infection. And it represents basically a, a promising alternative to ART. Um, however, we have to overcome the ADAs and we need to reproduce the success story of the Miami monkey to show durable virological control in a significant number of animals. And maybe at, at that time, um, people, more people, researchers, uh, doctors, and, and so on will realize how, how potent this approach is, and then we might be able to start clinical trials, but that's still far away. Um, I would like to thank everyone on the slides, especially my mentor, Ron DeRogers, uh, my longtime uh, colleague Jose Martinez Navio, and um, a big thanks to Guangping Gao. He's a longtime collaborator um, uh, at UMass, and um, 
our team at Scripps, uh, YAM team, the Wisconsin Primate Center, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Seb. Before we go into our Q&A session, I'd like to introduce to you Xing Ting, who is our product manager of uh, Molecular Biology Services. Uh, over to you, Xing Ting. Okay, thanks for the nice introduction, and thanks everyone. At GenScript, we deliver quality products at a very competitive turnaround, indicating that going with GenScript, you will never miss your deadline or deal with experiment failure. We are honored that we are able to generate very long and complex gene sequences with 100% accuracy, and the capability is recognized by peers. In addition, GenScript offers some commonly used tools for free, and, uh, such as GenSmart Design to vector or construct construction, and the GenSmart code optimization to increase the protein expression. As I listed in this slide, we offer cloning with genesis and the plasmid preparation to meet different needs. We offer uh, over 150 IP free vector for your use. And over the past years, we observed that the plasmid reuse is a problem for our client. So we launched the vector arc and the clone arc for you to store commonly used vector backbones and clones you generated in your orders. It means that you do have a free lab achieved at GenScript. And good news we would like to share with you is that we just launched mutant library bit testing, enabling any screening for protein engineering, antibody engineering purpose. And in 2018, GenScript launched a molecular cloud platform, integrating plas plasmid repository and the social functions. You may check our website for the details. That's all for my introduction on GeneScript Molecular Biology Services. If you have any questions on what we offer, please email us or contact us. Thank you all. Chisi, over to you. Thanks, Xinting. I see questions coming in. So first one, um, Said, uh, this approach is based on the episomal expression from AV, right? Do you think gene-specific insertion of these molecules could have any advantage, perhaps in terms of immunogenicity? Uh, uh, so, so basically, wild-type AV is capable of integrating into the genome, and that is known. So AV safely actually integrates near muscle-specific genes and doesn't cause any uh, troubles like uh, uh, any uh, mutagenesis and so on, um, which could cause like t tumors, right? Um, and um, however, for recombinant AVs, since the since most of the genome is basically removed and also sequence motifs that uh, hinder uh, integration, um, there is no little or no integration going on from recombinant AVs. Um, there is, of course, some residual integration, um, but that has not been really proven to be a problem. There were several publications out there trying to link it to uh, uh, liver carcinoma. However, it was not it was not definitive um, because uh, samples that uh, liver carcinoma cells that had integrated AV had the numbers of integrated AV genomes were as high as in as in samples were non cancer cells, uh, liver cells. So there was not really a linkage there. So AV is everywhere. Wild type sequences. Um, but there has been no evaluation of um, of recombinant AV uh, integration because there hasn't been, I mean, there have been a lot of clinical studies that have been done, but I think nobody has really looked at that in detail or a detailed comparison. Um, I don't think that integration would be a goal here. We, we don't want any integration. Um, we want to take advantage of episomal expression. Um, 
if one would uh, go for integration, then I think vector uh, that typically targets a region uh, that is safe to integrate. Then that's to go. Uh, however, uh, in the past the early days of gene therapy started with uh, lentiviral vectors and genoviral vectors, and they have been. Uh, uh, had been adverse uh, lethal consequences in some cases, and uh, the gene therapy field was rather shocked. And uh, uh, there has been a revival with with safer uh, viral vectors such as AV, and I think uh, that's the way to go. Thanks, Seb. Uh, question, next question is for muscular AIV delivery. Do you know any uh, switch off mechanism for additional safety of the approach? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, yes, uh, of course, one wants to have a continuous persistent high level expression. But of course, if uh, one wants to uh, achieve a uh, approval for clinical trials and won't regulate that expression because there, there's always, with any viral vector system, there are risks associated with it. Even, even if AV is, has been shown to be safe, uh, there are always risks. And there are, we are collaborating with several groups that have developed an off switch that has, uh, has proven to be effective. Um, however, it is optimized and um, there, are, um, there are possibilities to, to, to develop on switch and um, yeah. Thank you. Next the question is which are the alternatives that would have to be done in order to overcome the pre-immunity against AIV if this therapy is applied to humans? And which serotype of AIV are you using? Uh, can you repeat the first question? Yes. Which are the alternatives that would have to be done in order to overcome the pre-immunity against AIV if this therapy is applied to humans? Okay, um, so there are two possibilities. One, I think, is something very simple. One would simply flood the system with empty capsid decoys, um, which would deplete all neutralizing antibodies against the AV that the host uh, is, is having against that AV. And then immediately after, one would inject the AV intramuscularly. I would also like to point out that if there is a pre-existing immunity against a certain AV capsid, um, then if injected intravenously, there will be no uptake. However, uh, as in our own experience, even if they have pre-existing high immunity against, let's say, AV1, uh, you can still inject it intramuscularly and there will be a take no matter what because uh, these neutralizing antibodies will not be as highly concentrated as within the myofibers there and so there will be an uptake if injected at a relatively uh, at a higher dose than one would do if if those animal or if it was if there was no pre-existing immunity um and then uh, the second possibility is to simply design uh, um, shuffled capsids, which which have mutations at certain positions where 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 there are known epitopes for neutralizing antibodies, or to design like mixed AV serotypes uh, that are composed of several AV serotypes, which makes it then harder. Uh, for neutralizing antibodies to neutralize it. Uh, um, and the second question, oh, which AV serotypes we used? Um, we, in our initial studies, we used AV1 because it's a very, uh, it's very effective at transducing muscle cells. Um, however, it has shown to be a little bit more immunogenic than other AV serotypes such as AV8 um, um, and also AV1 can uh, transduce uh, antigen-presenting cells 
which is a problem. Um, AV8 is not so good at that. Uh, however, AV8 can transduce muscle cells, is less immunogenic, and is also partially liver tropic, which is good too, um, in case one wants to achieve a partial liver transduction uh, for a short period of time. Um, yeah, so those two AV serotypes were used in our studies. Okay. Can you induce the antibody expression only upon HIV challenge? This may overcome the anti-antibody response. Say it again. Can, can you induce the antibody expression only upon HIV challenge? And uh, uh, do you think this may overcome the anti-antibody response? Anti-drug antibody, I guess he means. Uh, well, I'm not sure if I understand it correctly, but we see we, we see ADAs uh, in the context of uh, of an of um, if we deliver AV to naive animals which were not infected, uh, we also see ADAs when uh, there was uh, there's already an infection ongoing. Um, so I think that's uh, it's independent of the state of uh, SIV or SHIV infection. Okay. Are there any promising approaches to avoid ADAs? Yes, they are, <laughs> and, and we are working on it for quite a while now, but uh, I cannot say much about this. Okay. Do you know any of um, clinical trial currently on course for AV-based systemic, systemic expression of any molecules? not necessary in the HIV field. Uh, I'm not sure what systemic, what is that? I, um, I cannot answer this question, I'm sorry. That's fine. Um, next question, I think due to time consideration, we have one more. So, um, how do you access the levels of anti-AIV antibodies and did the outcome of treatment correlate with the levels of anti-AAV? No, they do not correlate. Uh, as I yeah, as I mentioned before, it's the uh, ADAs are independent of the state of infection. Uh, they will occur no matter what, uh, and the magnitude. I'm not yeah, I, I cannot recall that it's affected by that at all. It will be if it the um, the ADA solely um, are affected simply by the unique antibody sequence um, and the um, the distance from germline. The more distance the antibody is from germline, the more unusual structured it is. The higher the ADA is, independently of the state of SIV or SHIV infection. And uh, the first question, can you repeat this? How do you access the levels of uh, the levels of anti-AV antibodies? How do I access? You mean how they are measured? Yeah, um, I mean, access. I mean, assess. we 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 uh, well, we we don't well, we do it by ELISA basically or neutralization assay. Um, um, that's basically it for pre-screening of AV status of animals and for the ADAs against the transgene product, the antibody. Um, there we also have ELISAs in place where we can uh, specifically detect ADAs against uh, antibody A or B or C, uh, which is specific for that antibody only. Okay. Thanks, Seb, and thank you all for attending. We hope you find this webinar useful. Again, we would like to hear your feedback, so please help complete the survey after the webinar, and we appreciate you uh, sharing this with your social media networks. Thank you, and have a nice day.